Welcome to another episode of Miss Out Without Outsiders. My name is Jeremy S. Gary, and today's guest is DJ and marketing expert Tyler Johnson. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. You know, I always have to remind myself to introduce myself on on the name podcast. <laughs> <I've been laughs> because it be someone's first time. You exactly. Make sure you plug yourself. I'm Jeremy S. Gary, and this is Tyler Johnson. Is this my camera? That's your camera. Okay. And then we have an overall camera. Anyway, Beautiful. We're all good. Okay. Well, thank you for, for being here. I, we met like two years ago. Two years ago. Through a partnership we had for the New York City Marathon. Correct. And uh, we can mention the company you work with? Yeah, I work for JD Sports. Um, we are headquartered um, in both the UK and here in Indianapolis. Some of you might formally know us as Finish Line. So, um, I didn't even so, realize that was... So JD acquired Finish Line... Um, at this point now, that um, the acquisition was back in like 2018, so the JD brand is really the umbrella that we live under, and my team is a pretty big part of how we are rebranding and expanding that brand um, around the country. Um, obviously, I'm super focused on New York City and the East Coast market, but JD as a brand also has a very big global presence too. Um, and so it's fun to be They're able to play with London based, right? London based. Yeah. And okay. we're, you know, we've got flagships in Paris, Tokyo. One of my friends was like on the Canary Islands and there's a JD sports there. Really? Like, so random. Well, we're in London now. We should, okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We'll, yeah, do, some we'll, just, we'll do something yeah, across the pond. <laughs> um, well, okay. Well, that, that's your, that's your, your nine to five, your yes. professional career. But we want to know about you. Uh, Outside of that, although that is a big part of you, of big course. piece of it, yeah. Uh, where are you from originally? So I'm originally from the Midwest. I grew up um, in a small town outside of Kansas City. And I typically will just say, like, oh, I grew up around Kansas City because people start to ask questions about the geography and, like, exactly where I'm from. But it's a flyover state, so no one really knows um, exactly where I'm from. But it's a tiny town called Parsons, um, and I spent most of my life in kansas honestly before i moved out to new york wow. city yeah so i spent not everyone knows this but i spent one year in ohio for my freshman okay. year of college midwest. so midwest uh freshman year of college and it's an experience i wouldn't trade but that's nice i did of not you to like say. it <laughs> that's nice of you to say <laughs> I, well, because, because in all honesty i didn't know i thought this was the norm and we're in new york i thought new york was the norm mm -hmm. i thought everything well, any city was like New York. I just assumed cities are New York, and I was very mistaken. Um, specifically, I remember the eye-opening moment for me was, uh, you know, I was in Ohio, maybe like third third week of school or one month in. I'm like, you know, I need my my need my city fix. Mm -hmm. Let's go to Columbus. We're like 30 minutes from Columbus. So I had a little hoopty car. I'm surprised it made it over there. <laughs> and um, so me and my roommates at the time decided to drive to Columbus. So. It was supposed to be like a 30 minute drive. 45 minutes later, I'm like, hey guys, um, how far is the city? They're like, we're in the city. I'm like, no. No way. Where's the city? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize that, I, I, honestly, I didn't realize that cities, not all cities have high rises. Like, yeah. I thought that's what defined a city. Big buildings, millions of people. And it wasn't that, culturally, it was a big shock for me as well. Mm. Um, so it's interesting, uh, someone, like yourself, who's a culture creator in New York, uh, from what I've seen watching yeah. you on social media and so on, to have come from a place that's in the Midwest, you know, I always find it fascinating and uh, impressive when somebody comes to New York City from a small town and still manages to guide culture in a way. Yeah, well, I feel like I moved to New York and was, even before I moved here, kind of learning about culture outside of my little bubble because you do sort of start to hit a wall of like there are certain things I'm interested in and certain things that I want to do that just they exist but maybe they exist in a way that feels like there's a, a threshold that you reach and so I had been lo sort of looking out of my fishbowl for a long time and looking at cities like Chicago Miami yeah. New York and sort of getting a feel for like what I was missing and then I got here and got really you know involved in nightlife and involved in um just the creative scene and i was meeting a lot of people who not weren't necessarily from a small town just like mine but people from suburban communities yeah. people from dc people from austin texas from houston from denver boulder you you know out pacific northwest and there were a lot of transplants and so i started to think as i was you know starting to engage in with events and curating my own experiences 
like there are a lot of New Yorkers here, but there are also a lot of non New Yorkers here. Yeah. And so how do you create experiences that can sort of satisfy the need of someone who's getting outside of their comfort zone for the first right. time and they they want something new? How do you like satisfy the New Yorker who like is really expecting, you know, shit to pop because yeah, it's New York. Yeah, yeah. But then also thinking about myself when I was new to the city and I also wanted to feel comfortable and I didn't want to be like, I didn't want to have whiplash every time I went to an event or to a party. And so I feel like having grown up outside of the city, I'm always kind of seeing things bird's eye view of like everyone who's in the room yeah. and everyone's unique backgrounds and how that sort of plays into what they're expecting what they experience and then what they're going to take away from it once well, that, they that comes with eq like emotional intelligence be able to read the room and read people that's an important skill to have especially if we're in the events world oh and yeah community building world. i mean we're just kind of watching people re- interact with the yeah. space or it, each other and i always always like taking mental notes of like who's having a good time who's not having a good time and do i know why and like how do we how does right. the space and the experience evolve so that everybody, you can't, you know, some people are just going to not have a great time no matter what you're doing. But of course I am certainly trying to read the room and trying to be cognizant of people's experiences. Now you said looking out of a fishbowl, but how, how did you feel? Did you feel, uh, I don't imagine people in Kansas city, uh, being like New Yorkers at all. And, um, I've never been, so maybe that's a judgment mm-hmm. I should take back. But um, did you find that you fit in well in Kansas City? Or did you did you feel like you always wanted to find life in another city? That's, I mean, that's a good question. I feel like I fit in the way that I needed to. I don't, I don't know if I could say I fit in well or if I didn't. Ask my friends. I don't know, but um, I think that I was. Even in Kansas City, I grew up in a in a much smaller town, and so. I, you know, had a lot of experiences in like predominantly white institutions where I sort of fit in, but not all the way fit in. And then I had experiences where I was, maybe I didn't feel like I fit in socioeconomically, or maybe there were situations where you don't know that if like from an educational standpoint, you're up to snuff with the crowd around you. So there, there was sort of always maybe a little box that was left unchecked because like, how do you, when you feel like the other, it's, it's always easy to find like your otherness when you're in a group of people That's and and point. then but i would like i don't know that i felt like oh i have to get out of here because i'm not fitting in i think right. there were just some boxes that were not checked because of some of those differences or maybe some of my interests right. and so i really just moved to new york to to have more space to spread out and more space to breathe um i th- love Kansas City and like I visit my friends and family back in Kansas City as often as I can and the city has evolved so much so there are times that I move back and I'm like damn if only Kansas City was like this when I was 22 I would have stayed longer because I always felt like I left too soon like I peaked too soon 22 when you left I moved here um, 23 going on 24 uh did you do you went to high school there did you college there I did high school yeah grew up in a sm- my small town, high school in my small town, went to Kansas State University. Shout out to K State. We mm-hmm. got knocked out of the tournament already. Our women's team is still in though, which Wait, is great. They, this is today. They got knocked out already. We didn't make it. We're not in the big dance. Not yeah. us. we're not doing yeah, it. Yeah. We're not doing it. Kansas State, yeah. I love you guys, but like, didn't they do pretty well last year? We, you know, we've got this amazing coach, Coach Tang. Um, really cool dude. Like, really big energy. I think Kansas State, and I'm not a sports expert, we recruit decently well, but I don't know. It's just one of those things where, like, we come up against it and we're, like, there, and then something is always just not right. We've got a phenomenal – Sounds like the Knicks. We've got got a phenomenal (laughs) football program, um, but our women's team um, is is really fantastic Shout out to women's sports right now. As well. Women's college basketball. College basketball, track, tennis. Crazy. name it, like – We've got like Shakira, I mean, we've Clark, got Caitlin these, Clark, yeah. we've got so many big names. I mean, they're gonna retire Maya Moore's jersey. Yeah. You, I mean, like, I mean, I feel like in the last there year, been there's been tremendous progress. I feel like in women's sports. sports in general has been. I, I'm a '90s kid, and I feel like I watched a lot of phenomenal women in the WNBA in the '90s, really kind of trailblaze what it meant to be like Lisa Leslie forward facing yeah. figures in sports Pretty and really like yeah. advocating for women yeah. in sports, whether it's just fair pay or like 
having adequate resources, gyms and, and those sorts of things. And there's obviously still a long ways to go, but like, yeah, shout out women's sports. Yeah. Like they're killing it. They're blowing it. up right now. They're it's beautiful it. to see. And I wouldn't want to be one-on-one -on -one with anybody in the league personally. Do you play basketball? I played basketball. Okay. I was not the best, but I had a lot of fun and I got, you know, what's that they say about you? I got I had spunk, but I don't know that I was <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that I was that talented. So uh so college was in in Kansas City. Yeah. Well, and then uh, I moved to New York after school. So I like went to college, I got a job in in an agency at an agency. Kansas um, City is where you're from. Yeah. Kansas State is where I went to school. Okay. So yeah, yeah. Kansas City Missouri, Kansas side, but like they're just it's just a city split between they're on the state line. Okay. It's just a big city. Kansas, Missouri. I I grew. I was living on the Kansas side of gotcha. of Kansas City. But See, I've never been, so I don't know the landscape. Yeah, you know, when 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 I was in school in Ohio, and I was telling people, uh, you know, where we're what I grew up uh, with Chris, where we live in Jersey is, it's you know, there's parts of Jersey that are suburbs. Is that where you of, grew up, Jersey? Yeah. Okay. Parts of Jersey that are suburbs of Philadelphia. Parts of Jersey that are almost like an extended borough of New York. Mm -hmm. So, and then there's parts of Jersey that are Jersey proper. I don't really know enough to, about Jersey that proper to be like, <laughs> tell people about that I know about it. So when yeah. I tell people, when I, so when I travel, I ask me where I'm from, New York, and ask me where I live. Well, I actually live in Jersey City. And uh, so when I was in school in Ohio, and I was telling people, you know, in New York, but you know, you see where I live with Jersey. They're like, why would you say New York? Oh, well, it's because it's like 10 minutes away. Like, how's that possible? I'm like, yeah, people have a hard time with yeah. geography. And it's like, if you're that confused, just literally Google Maps. Well, it. there was no Google Maps well, in yeah. 99. All right. <laughs> <laughs> different. Yeah. Different. You're map questing your way to <laughs> and from destinations, which I was exactly. just talking about with a friend the other day. And I was like, who in your, who in the family was responsible for printing out the like oh, directions? Man. And it was me. So I had to print out the directions, but then How my parents, I mean, I'm 31, but like okay. I was pretty tech. My parents are not tech savvy. Yeah. So if I was, I mean, we got a computer in okay, the house. Imagine with prior to Google Maps. I don't even want to know. Uh, drawing a line on the map, showing where you're going to go and knowing, like, having to have that map in the, in the car. I think that's why my parents didn't do a lot of traveling before, yeah. <laughs> the, inter the, before the internet <laughs> was like a thing because I'm printing out the directions yeah. and I'd be like, all right, here's how we're getting there. My dad's like, you don't know anything. And I'm like, I do know yeah. because I printed out. The directions and i studied this so like if you want to get yeah. you know to dallas today right. you gotta you gotta follow me so when you were when you graduated college yeah there's what a year or two where you spent in kansas City i before? spent about a year after graduation in kansas kansas city area and then i moved to new york but what, right. were you, what did you study at school um i studied marketing yeah. um and what the hell else did i study Marketing. Which is now why you're marketing expert. Yeah, yes, exactly. Shout out to my degree. <laughs> um, no, I, studied, I studied marketing um, <clears throat> on management with like a focus in human resources because I had this idea in mind that at some point I would be doing my own thing in a way of like working with people, leading teams, leading projects and having that like HR knowledge, even from like a true like nuts and bolts of like how to like hire someone how, right. to, how you should like adequately pay people yeah. and, and all of those things i was like this stuff is gonna i'm gonna need this information at some point um and even though i'll probably have to relearn a lot of those things there's a pretty solid foundation i have that has served me well as i've started to venture out and do my own gotcha. stuff here so what were you doing when you graduated you, you were in kansas city for a year what did you do i was year? at an agency and i was doing social media and uh, this agency, uh, Barclay, they primarily, well, at the time, a lot of their clients were like food in the food and beverage category. So it was like Dairy Queen, Sonic, Wingstop, yeah. Sunny Delight. I don't know. Just yeah. random. All of this terrible for you. <laughs> all this like just stuff that I'm yeah. like, what? But, you know, I we so we ran social media um, accounts. And so it was a lot of like content, monthly content planning. And I sat pretty close to our creative team. And so we were doing a lot of storyboards of like, here's what the month looks like. Right. And I'm just like feeding them kind of like things from pop culture and feeding them things that our, that our audience is sort of speaking about and then figuring out what our sort of messages were for the month that way, which was a really fun job. It was so, it was a lot of work. Like yeah. people that work in social media now, I'm like, damn, that is it was hard in 2000, what was that, like 16? I can't even imagine 
being like the director of social media for a brand in 2024. Why is there so many moving parts? There's just so much happening yeah. and there's so many conversations happening. And so I think it would be challenging unless you really like are dialed in on what you do and say, I think it's hard because you want to be a part of all these conversations happening online. Yeah. And so to have that ability to really filter out the noise of like this conversation is giving, you know, getting a lot of engagement, but it's not for us. Right. Like there's a lot of engagement with that conversation, but it doesn't make sense for us. And I think I didn't have that filter, but to have to do that as your job every single day, I think would just. I'm, I'm glad now I have somebody that runs the outside social, but I was running four cities by myself for the whole imagine. time. And now, now I have five cities, but I've got a great team that helps out because it was taking me two hours a day for four cities. And it was just something I didn't feel like I should be spending my time doing. That's nuts. Um, overseeing, sure. But anyway. So uh, did you move to New York with a job opportunity or did you just pick up and go? I moved here. I was pretty practical. I'm a little more willing to take risks now in my life, but I did move here partially because I didn't want my parents to be able to say like, oh God, what are you doing? Not that I was living under their like guidance or their like their rule, but I grew up very close to my family and so I wanted to move here and to have them not be worried and to have yeah. them not be concerned because Kansas, when you look at it on a map, is really far from New York City for, for my parents. Yeah. And so I, you know, I was really uh, um, focused on having a job first. And I knew someone from a previous internship. We had interned at a company when we were like maybe in our junior year of college. And I saw that she got a job in New York City. I called her. I was like, yo, Olivia, like. When did you move to New York? When were you going to tell me this? Yeah. I see you're working at this company. You and I had a similar internship. So if I'm just comparing apples to apples, yeah. I might be able to at least get an interview. Like that was just how I saw it. And, yeah. it. and it made sense to me. And I was like, can I email you my resume? Let me update it. Um, and can you give it to someone? And she said, I don't know, but I'll, I'll look, I'll yeah. ask. And she gave my resume to the like HR team that had contacted her about the job. I had a couple conversations, interview. I flew out here for an interview like August of 2015, and I moved out here the following March. Okay. Yeah. What was the job? Um, I was a buyer. For? Yeah, for Macy's. Okay. I was like a buyer, and I was like a buying training department, so like you learned just the facets of the buying model and sort of learning their ecosystem of how they manage that workflow. Um and so in that training, you get moved around to like various different departments. It was like menswear, home goods. I was like selling table plates and stuff. How long did you work there? Not very long. <laughs> <laughs> How long is not very long? Not very long. It was like maybe max like 10 months. And did you go from, to JD from there or finish I, line? I ended up just working independently. So that was when I sort of, I moved out here for a job and I was really excited about it. And it was, the pay was good for the time. I was like living in hell's kitchen which like is not cheap <laughs> at all um and i was like oh yeah i got a job i can pay my rent i don't have to ask my parents for things great and then i didn't love the job and it had nothing to do with the organization it had everything to do with me maybe not being in the right place and i sort of wrestled with that like do i stay and like get promoted and if i or if i set my sights on a different department will i feel better or if i end up on their marketing team will i feel better I kind of knew that I needed some time to like figure my stuff out. So I just quit and I got a job at a restaurant and started going out with my friends who were DJing and started to like, that's where the DJ started, started huh? to open my eyes up a little bit because I didn't, I didn't know a lot of creative people who had like creative careers in New York city who weren't like mega famous. Right. It was like, I knew people in corporate and then I knew like, the you know who was like i knew like all of these like bloggers and like there was the man repellers of the world and there was like style.com and there yeah. was style rookie and you either had to be a really famous like blogger writer someone or you had a nine to five job and i didn't know what that in between looked like even though i knew that djs existed even though i knew that party promoters existed i grew up in the middle of the country and so that just wasn't something that i was that plugged into right. but the moment i started to learn more about what was happening 
you know, we go out and I'd be like, oh, the DJ was sick. That was so fun. Yeah. I was like, okay, how did this even happen? How did right. you get here? Who booked you? Yeah. How much do they pay you? How much is this space? How did you it's get a, a really How did you invite all of us here? Lifestyle And industry. like, did, did you email all of us or was it a text thread? Is there a Discord yeah. or is there a Reddit? Like, A lot of people thread? don't ask these questions. I was just kind of blown away because I was, you know, I was just invited by a friend of mine who had this party like called the level party and I was just finding out by word of mouth. But then, you know, every once in a while he would send like an email that you knew clearly went to a, a whole list of people. And so I grew very fascinated with like all the different ways people were getting the message out yeah. about like things happening in the city. And I didn't go back to a nine to five job for like four years because I was like, yo, I got my money from my serving and bartending job and I'm going to, promote and like host some parties and you know i promoted for 15 yeah, years yeah I so didn't, like yeah that was years. where i started to have a lot of fun with like the idea of community as um as a vehicle for like yeah. experiences and it didn't have to be like super branded all the time for it to be really special you could just kind of find people who have a similar interest whether it be taste in music or taste in food also or where culture is created totally on that level and you know? i i don't i knew that that existed mm -hmm. but it was asking the right people like how the hell did we all get here yeah. um and i've started and i've i've learned a lot from the people around me but i've also just learned a lot on my own of just trying things and seeing what sticks yeah i mean it's a know? school of hard knocks i think i learned them i learned so much more with nightlife than ever did in college. I mean, in college, I, I is think. It raining? Yep, it's raining. It's raining. It's raining. It's raining. We don't. We got the proper gear thanks to North Face. So thank you. <laughs> Waterproof down. Exactly. We're good. <laughs> Not worried about any rain. So you were promoted for 15 years, and that yeah. I mean, I was talking to someone the other night. My friend had a DJ set, um, and there was a fellow DJ in the booth, and I was like. Oh, you know, we were just chatting about where we play and, and, and what we've been doing. And he looks at me. He's like, oh, yeah, I've been doing just this for 10 years. And I was like, well, I've been in New York for like barely 10 years. And I couldn't fathom having my whole experience be like dedicated. I mean, I would I'm sort of turning in that direction, which yeah. is great. But I'm like, damn, that's a long time. And I don't say it to mean, oh, it must be exhausting. I say it with this sort of sentiment of like, oh, I wonder what he's done in those 10 years. Like that's how much has happened and like, who has he met? Where has he oh been? What's God. gone on? And like, what's changed? Ten, nine, nightlife years are like dog years. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like 10 nightlife years is like 70 lifely years. Like, oh, you yeah. meet so many people, you do so much. And it's like the volume of people you meet is insane. Your network grows exponentially, like especially faster than anyone else. It's it blows crazy. my mind. Like I have a birthday next week and we're inviting people. And I'm like, as I'm doing these invites, I'm trying to remember like, okay, I know that I've known this person for six years, but where was it and how did it happen? And in, in a lot of cases, I do remember, yeah. but it takes me a oh, minute. You got to, I take notes. Oh, yeah. And I'm yeah. like, look at my notes app and I'm like, okay, 2017, this night, this happened. And it's, it's yeah. wild, the amount of experiences that have sort of been woven into my New York experience yeah. just because of the, the sort of pivot in my career. Right. I was just like, well, I got all this time now. I mean, like hosting parties... And being the facilitator somehow, right? My favorite thing to do. It, 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 uh, it's a great thing to do, but like people don't understand. I use this as an example. We had one product, mm -hmm. a party. Mm -hmm. and sort of there's variations of this product. However, if you, I used to do four or five nights a week. I had to make every one of these nights, each one of these products, seem unique mm -hmm. and special enough mm -hmm. for people to want to come out even on a February Wednesday, you know, in the cold. So it made me learn how to create a brand and make something, something mundane or, or maybe, maybe something they've already experienced seem interesting and, totally. and find the uniqueness in everything. Mm -hmm. And I actually had to find a uniqueness for myself so I'd be able to talk about it. Like, what, what's so unique about this? You find little details and then yeah. tell the story and, and, and exploit those details. So in regards to... Now with, with outsiders, these are unique adventures, and there are there are unique experiences. Mm -hmm. It's so much easier. But I learned how to promote and 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 
advertise these events so much more because of my experience doing it. Bless you. Yeah. Uh, by the way, are the cameras good? Yeah, no, I had a spot about the car. That's all right, this one's good? Yeah, yeah. All right, all right. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's interesting you say like the pro the one product is this party or this experience and then how do you speak to people about it in a way that can help them differentiate from like what was the thing that happened on Wednesday compared to the thing that's happening on Friday? Are they the same? And if they're the same, I'm not going to both. Right. right? Or like, I you know, or, and so I've, but the, it's tough, but they might be you the can same, figure it out. But there's though. always something there's different. There's always something different, whether it's the music or it's the space or it's the ethos of what you're doing. And I've really tried my best. One thing that I've started recently was like, I started writing this newsletter called Groove Theory. And nice name. Right? Yeah. There, <laughs> there's, um. so I, I, Love this R and B duo called Groove Theory. Mm -hmm. um, they're from the early two thousand, late nineties, early two thousand. Yeah, late nineties. They've got like they're good, and they're yeah. they're a really phenomenal group. So I it was inspired I, by I, that. I, I, I'm sorry I haven't seen you DJ yet, but now I have to go. Now see you DJ. gotta come. Out. This is my to. elevator pitch for Jeremy to come out. I'm there. Like it's, it's, just, <laughs> just do me a favor, just, just find me a place where if I need to take a seat, I'll sit down. <laughs> Look, I only I only DJ at spaces that have nice seating. Okay. I only DJ. I only DJ nice places. <laughs> well, not they're not all, they're all not all that nice, all but right. you have somewhere to sit. But um, right. you know this this newsletter Groove Theory or dance. I started. There's gotta be room to dance. And you can always dance. Yeah. I always like to create a space where people can meet up with their friends and sit and gather. And if the music so compels you to dance, then there's space to yeah. do that. But that's not really required right. because I'm not always somebody like I don't want to walk into a space and only be able to dance unless I was like, OK, this is a rave night. Like that's a totally. Yeah. And even when you go to raves, like there's the ambient room where you can go sit the heck down and like yeah. rest your legs, like rest your joints. Like we're getting older. Um, <laughs> but I, I'm using this newsletter groove theory to sort of help me explore for myself the difference in my own taste of music, like across the idea of groove, what does house music make me feel versus jungle versus soul versus disco versus you know 90s miami club music yeah. and on down the line like what are all the differences in those grooves and how do i talk about them what experiences can i relate them to and then the more i sort of figure that out i can create a little ecosystem for that genre and then attach it to a party concept and give it a name and choose a venue and figure and out who the, and then figure out who the right marketing tactics who the right people are own, yeah. right to then bring to it because and I don't want to do that so much that it feels like I'm overly over curating something mm. but at the same time I don't want to just like throw something at a wall and see what and just to see what sticks right. because people have so many options of things to do even if you're, no matter what your interests are in New York City, like if you like knitting, there's a fuck ton of knitting things. Sorry, right. I don't know if I can curse you like can. that on here. Whatever you want If to you say. love to knit, like there's a knitting night in my neighborhood at Prima, this restaurant, Prima Brooklyn, where like on Sundays you bring your own yarn <laughs> and wine and you knit. And then I would start talking to my old roommate about it. And there's so many versions of that one thing to go to, right? And so no matter what your interests are, it's like you if you pull up, you know, RA or like Eventbrite or whatever it might be in New York, are people still, I don't know if Eventbrite is still a thing, but like you could search for days for things yeah. to do. And so I'm always like, if I can do the work on my own of like really figuring out why, similar to what you said with your events with outsiders, like how this is different, why it's different and who, and who I'm necessarily like trying to speak to with it. I'll, I'll do that legwork ahead of time so that people making a decision is easier because yeah. people have like, you know, fatigue of like choice all the time. And if I don't know how my events are yeah. different, now they're going to be exhausted about picking and choosing which of my events to come to. And I don't really want that. I want them to be excited about the fact that there's something happening. You I know? mean, yeah, I, I get the feeling. It's, it's like, you ever go to a restaurant and the menu's monstrous? Yeah, Cheesecake Factory. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can't, you don't know what to choose. So I think uh, pulling out the stress of decision making for people, uh, making it, easy for them to, to commit it. yeah and it's, even 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 like we have a variety of activities but for folks joining us they don't need to plan anything they just they look at it they click and then everything is is set yeah you know? you're, you're you guys are great i i honestly <laughs> i'm trying to get my friends together to do one of these and i was actually i'll make a deal with you i'll come to your dj set with deal. friends okay. you come to an outsiders boom, shake boom. that's how it works done 
this is how we do business exactly. guys <laughs> um but i was you know i was scrolling with some friends i've got a, a group of friends that we just went upstate like um a couple of months ago and we were like oh yeah let's do this again we wanted to go hiking for, as part of the trip but my friends chickened out because it got a little wet so i'm like i gotta find my friends that are down for outdoor activities yeah. no matter what the elements are and i was actually showing my girlfriend Julie, um you know the the outsiders like platform which is like oh my god there's so much on here yeah. i'm like yeah like come on like let's get excited there's some so people who aren't into hiking or aren't into cycling there's a variety there's some people who who enjoy like are tubing snow tubing, i know i saw you guys tubing. do like river tubing i river was like yo i had no idea because it doesn't require any and i love a little river tubing. outside i mean i guess you have to swim a bit but like just chill, chill. just float music <laughs> drinks and like you float it's like amazing summer activity i mean i love a float trip i grew yeah. up like, near the river and like i love a float trip and it's like a staple summer activity cheap beer no, we'll get nice some beer. floaties. We'll get nice beer. <laughs> I'm like, I, I, yeah, give me something nice. We're not getting like natty ice here. <laughs> Are you sure? I mean, I, I know. I, I'm not I don't know if you're... <laughs> <laughs> we forgot where this story started. Uh, I'm from Kansas. Kansas is, <laughs> right. I forgot that was the, the drink of choice in I college in, in Ohio. Fraternity. I was in a fraternity and like I've drank my fair share of like very yeah. cheap. I mean, everyone in, beer. in, in uh, listen, when you're broke, when you're young, like, you drink what I, I used to just, drink. I used to have like, Money for one drink to go to the club. What would you we order? Guess what we would order? We have one drink and you're in broke. We're gonna do like a PBR. No. When you what do you like, do for uh, one dollar? No, not one dollar. <laughs> okay. One drink, one mixed drink. What are you gonna buy? You want to go to Buck? Long Island Ice Tea is absolutely no, correct. That was what I drank when I started going out. Yeah. Before. Because that has like that's like seven drinks in one. You're like I'm gonna get a Long Island I don't Island condone tea. this. This is not me condoning. Uh, I don't drink either. So, uh, anyway. I digress. Um, yes. <laughs> okay, so uh, <laughs> got a little lost. Here. So uh, you you started working for yourself for four years doing uh, uh, hospitality. Yep. You started learning the roles of DJ. Learning the DJ, then. hosting parties. Well, really, I was doing a lot of just hosting events and promoting events. It wasn't really until the end of that my restaurant experience when I realized I wanted to turn the corner and beyond just putting DJs together or putting a party together, I really was like, I should step into DJing. And this was at the recommendation of my friends as well. And it was one of those things where, you know, you ask yourself like, I could do that, why don't I do that? Yeah. And I I didn't have an answer. So I was like, all right, well, <laughs> we gotta start. And so that was, you know, starting my journey as a DJ really only amplified my opportunity to bring people together because suddenly you go from just putting the flyer together and inviting people to really curating the experience and yeah. suddenly these club owners <clears throat> and club promoters and, and restaurant owners give you a little bit more trust and they give you a little bit more responsibility to say like, this is our space, but it's yours for the evening or for the night or whatever. Um, and we that's like do what you want, yeah. but like let us know so in case it's too left field. We can yeah, just yeah. be prepared. But for the most part, people have given me a lot of free reign because they also want their jobs and their lives to be easier. Like if I'm the events director at a hotel, I don't want to plan every event myself. Like that's crazy. Like that's crazy talk. Right. And so people like me are able to step in and help offset some of that labor because we're willing to like, you know, take the third Friday every month or the, you know, the every other Friday of a month and program something, whether it's me DJing or me bringing friends in. Right. Um, and that's one less date for them to worry about filling. It's one less gate for me to worry about booking. And I just have to focus on getting people out. So yeah, that makes sense. Um, when was your, when did you decide to go back to corporate America and what was it JD? Yeah, so I went back to corporate and went back to JD. <clears throat> and this was after doing, so I was an intern for JD when they were finish line. Timelines are going to start to get confusing, but many years ago. Yeah. Um, and I remember leaving that internship and not accepting the full-time job they offered me because I wanted to move to New York. Um, but I stayed close with um, my team at the time who I had met during that internship and really saw a few of them, a couple of them as mentors, which I'm such a strong advocate for people, no matter what age you are, like people, you should have someone in the, in your life, whether they're related to you or not, 
usually someone who's not related, so you don't have too many conflicts of interest, right? right, right. Um, someone that you can look to for advice or guidance, and they don't have to be in the same field as you. Just it's nice to have a professional sounding board. And I finished my internship and, and still had some of that. And when this job opportunity came about, they it was them that reached out to me and were like, oh, you know, there's this opportunity in New York City, um, you know, in marketing, it's events, it's brand, it's culture, it's we need someone who's kind of plugged in in yeah. New York City who can help us get plugged in at the cultural level, um, at the local level and connecting with communities. And that work is how we met. That work is how I've met so many people. It's how I meet other DJs, honestly. Like sometimes I get to book DJs for gigs through JD for doing a big event, you know, surrounding the marathon or surrounding right, yeah. the NBA draft or surrounding the Super Bowl, it, it runs the gamut. Um, we have opportunities to work with brands like North Face or, or other brands where we can bring people in, we can platform creatives, whether they're DJs or independent makers or designers or just sneakerheads, content creators. There's a lot of ways now that the work I'm doing at JD is almost... Um, it's supplemented by the work I do outside of it, but it's also enriched by it because right. I think now the work that I do when we're tying brand to culture is informed by everything I've learned over the past seven ish years. A lot of the origin of culture comes right. from that life and comes from, you know, they'll go, Oh, can we book? We need to book a DJ and like, we need someone. And I'm like, Oh, well, I here's this list of yeah, people exactly. that I've met that I feel like makes sense for this reason or for that reason. So it's nice now that my I feel like I'm in a position finally where my day job and the job that I do outside of it that's really fueled by my passion, they kind of work in tandem. Not all the time, but there's a lot of overlap that is exciting for me to see um, because I've always wanted to try to blend my worlds together. I think a lot of what I'm doing is world blending. Um, and it's, it's, I'm fortunate to have the opportunity to do that right. with, with this current role that I'm in. Nice. I mean, I think it makes sense. It's not, I'm a firm believer, like I've said before, that nightlife and downtown scene, the arts, the creatives are the ones creating culture, right? So if you look at New York City's landscape, uh, when Giuliani was mayor, he pushed all of the nightclubs to the west side, industrial, unwanted areas, mm -hmm. like Meatpacking District. Meatpacking District at the time was a lot of uh, prostitution, a lot of drugs, uh, and then the meatpacking industry was literally meatpacking. Yeah. Uh, clubs started going there and uh, became a desirable area. Now it's like the second Fifth Avenue. Um, so. Uh, yeah, I've been reading this book, <clears throat> Love Saves the Day, and it's this book just about like m the music and club scene which if you haven't read it it's it. love it saves the day it. it's so beautiful um and there are various you know sections of the book where you're getting into music coming out of new york out of detroit out of chicago but right now where i'm reading where it's in new york and there are a lot of these clubs, you know, on the West side. And I'm like, what the hell happened? Like, I would have loved to go to like, you know, I would have loved to hear like Rich Medina at like APT. Oh, I went to APT. Which not was... that. That is not it. I'm like, this looks like, I looked at the book really quick and it's like a cat. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Hold on a second. Um, but Rich Medina, APT, uh, yeah. Bobito, like all those guys. I mean, I, w I was there and... and I was already admiring these guys. They had to develop names for themselves. By the way, Richmond Dinn has a dope club in Miami called uh, Dante's Hi-Fi. You got to check it out. Yo, I haven't been yet, but Amazing. when I tell you, I haven't spent a lot of time in Miami, but the last time I was there, I was dying to go to Dante's. I, I went and there four I days did in not make it, but I'm coming back. Miami, I'm coming back. Yeah. Like, so soon. Uh, definitely worth going. Um, and you got to find this book because it's not <laughs> Yeah, you got to find it. I'm going to send it to you, but yeah, I please. it's that um, cat thing. Yeah, this definitely not the cat. Uh, so, <laughs> so um, we kind of covered a good portion of your life here. Uh, is there any? Are there any details about high school or anything that that I like to cover with this podcast? People's the events in their lives that transpired to bring them to where they are I'm in their life now. You. I'm not texting in the classroom. I'm sending you. I know you are. The book. I, 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 there's not. Yeah, it's not the same <laughs> it's book. It's not the same book. It's your. It's, it makes a lot more sense. Yeah, now. that makes a lot more sense. Different yeah, exactly. different, yeah, it's a yeah, it's a, it's a calico. Um, um. <laughs> so my, the the what I enjoy about this podcast is seeing what events transpired in people's mm -hmm. lives that brought them to where they are. Totally. You know, 
some of the more interesting uh, interviews are ones that, where people have had multiple chapters in their lives. Totally. Whether it be, uh, uh, what stands out in my mind is Javier, who went from being a chef to a radio host to a uh, working in, con- in, in construction to then now doing uh, forecasting for Nestle. <laughs> I love that. Uh, uh, so, um, Nespresso, excuse me. So, yeah. Uh, are there any events in your life that stand out like that you feel like diverted you to where you are now? Uh, yeah, I I would say for me, you know, I again, I grew up in a fairly small town, but I grew up with um, in this community of people. So my best friend's family was from the south, from Louisiana, um, and they were this really fun family that looked just like my family but was very different from my family and I was always very fascinated by that because we again we looked similar we're just like black families in the midwest you know working class people but her family moved and spoke a certain way and I was just like what what is this like what is this sort of southern influence you know they spent some time in New Orleans and there's this sort of Cajun culture there's this there's a totally different black experience if you grew up in the bayou compared to me growing up in the Midwest, like near, near, basically near the Ozarks, which is like country, country, yeah. right? And my best friend's dad brought his passion for music to our neighborhood um, and how that manifested itself was in this like band that he made. So if you know anything about like Southern bands, like you've got like LSU's ma- massive band. Um, oh, you've so got like, Grambling yeah. State, like these yeah. Beyonce's homecoming, basically. Right. Those yeah. big bands, like fully suited out. You've got the majorettes, you've got the drum line, and you've got this whole beautiful experience. And it's this really vibrant um, culture in and of itself that I feel like is so unique to the United States. Like you don't really find this- In the South. In the South, too. Yeah. Like this- this version of music and playing music and performing for people, but also for yourselves. Cause it's a very like self-fulfilling experience yeah. being in a band like this. Um, it doesn't really exist anywhere else. <clears throat> and it definitely did not exist in like my hometown, but his kids, like he wanted his kids to not be separate from it. So he got all of us together. I'm like maybe five, six years old. Oh wow! No. And again, they're my neighbors. So I spent, I spent as much time at his in his his wife's home as I did in my own home. We just kind of bounced between our respective houses, and I'd sleep over there for three days, and then come back to my mm-hmm. parents' house. They're like, "Where have you been?" I'm like, "Oh, I'm down at the Harris's house." Yeah. Um, but this band became like the thing to do um, in our small town, and so like my cousins were in this band, my neighbors were in this band, like kids in my school were in this band. It was like the cool right. thing. We'd leave school. We're going to band practice, like get your sticks, like get your shorts on. And we would practice like in the streets and we would practice like on our block. We would practice at the park and because you don't have space to like, we didn't have rehearsal space. None of that existed. So it'd be a hot summer day, just like before we had drums, you were like hitting on boxes. Yeah. But when the drums didn't exist, you were just practicing the rhythm. Um, I didn't really love drumming that much. So I would sometimes skip the drums and I would like go back where the dancers were and I would just dance. I would kind (laughs) of oscillate between the two. Um, but I remember this experience of discovering new music because of the songs he would have us play. And so there were these like old, like disco tracks that he was like, we were doing as a band and like these old soul tracks we were doing as a band and they were songs that were familiar, but not songs that my parents were playing. And it's been really interesting because as we've all gotten older, I, those songs are still in my head a lot. Um, and I find myself like still like tapping out these old like drum rhythms. And I never got into drums because I was not very good at it. Okay. But it, <clears throat> I think what it did do is it sort of reminded me of the sort of expansiveness of music and it was and i was so young and so i think my taste in music is so expansive and not to like i'm not bragging i'm just it just is and i think a lot of it is like you know there was what was on the radio at the time and there was what was happening but then there was also this world of music that was happening at band practice and when the band would perform that allowed us to sort of explore with 
different sounds and different rhythms and different tempos and different um, sort of methods of constructing a song. So you're thinking about producing music or do you? No, already? it's well, it's, you know, when I started DJing, I only got into it as a way to bridge the gap between me and producers because I don't feel like I five years ago maybe had the skill set to produce. Now, having spent so much time learning to DJ and then getting closer to my friends who produce their own tracks that they play out, I'm now sitting down and looking at these tracks and listening to them and realizing that like I knew I've known about I've known how to build a song my whole life and I right. just never really tried to. Are you doing it now? And I'm now this is like breaking news. Breaking news. Breaking guys. news. No, I'm kidding. You um, heard it here first. But no, I am now, you know, thinking about how to revisit some of those experiences of like just beat building and just a drum kick yeah. and like at the most simple of its form because I love like drum and bass and break beats and all of that shit. And it's a lot of it is derivative of the music we were playing when we were kids. And I'm like, Oh God, yeah. I'm sort of realizing a lot of the connections between that experience and my own experience now. Um, and I have this <clears throat> dream of like being able to put together like a, a set that starts out in a very like analog way. That's like an old recording from our yeah. like practices because they exist on home video. Um, and I'm like, I would love to like, two hours of music inspired by sweating under like the hot Kansas sun, getting ready for like the parade. I, I've referenced know? this a couple of times in the last two weeks. Now that we're, we've got this uh, new, new season of, this, of the podcast. I'm reading a book uh, by Rick Rubin called the creative act. Mm -hmm. I think uh, it'll be beneficial for you to listen to while you're yeah, yeah. starting oh, your journey in production. Yeah, please do. Uh, I'll, I'll I've got my I've got my work cut out for me. So anyone that's got resources, please share. I them. got you. I got um, you. And I've got some. You know, I've got a lot of. What I will say about music in general is is that it's nice to have. It's nice to have things that you can learn. That can that can stretch beyond just hobby yeah. and really become practice even as I'm getting older, because I'm, I was such a hobbyist as a kid and I always, you, you're sort of picking up an instrument and then putting it down and then going to your, you know, tennis l lessons and then leaving and then going to karate and then yeah. coming back and then it's time to do homework. Not everyone's like that though. But I think I've spent so much time, maybe just because I was needed stimulation at that age, um, but I've always enjoyed being very active and like learning new skills and then practicing those skills. And so for me, it's nice that like, music and nightlife is a career like space but also it's just a space for me to like have a hobby and to learn something new well, and creative like outlet and just like pick up new skills and like you know i'm like on you know this saturday i will be able to like incorporate a new dj technique that i didn't know how to do two right. weeks ago yeah. that i didn't know how to do four weeks ago and 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 i think that's the fun and it is having an opportunity to learn something new and then do it yeah and then do it again until you're really right, good at right, it, right. right? The first time you try some of these things, you're like, oh shit, that was awful. Yeah. And with everybody paying attention. <laughs> um, but that's what practice rooms are for. That's what pirate studios are for. You, yeah. know, you can go etch those things out before you yeah, get in front yeah, of a I crowd. I see you like, working it out in your mind while you're talking to me about yeah. it. Like, it'll happen. Yeah. Listen to that book. Yeah. Uh, or read the book, excuse me. I do audio books, but I say listen. So I think it'll be beneficial and take totally. a little pressure off of your, your Absolutely. Uh, pressuring yourself to be creative. Yeah. Um, uh, what do you do for fun? What do I do for fun? Man, I do a lot. I love to run. I love to run. It's, it's like meditative and for me, that's fun. Like focus is fun. Um, I love to cook. I love to cook. Okay. Sometimes I get really What's excited. I've, you know, or I should say when I ask you, what do you think of? What do I think of? Yeah. I really love, love, love pesto on anything, right? And so my favorite thing is like trying to perfect my homemade pesto mix, like sauce. That's the thing I'm most focused on. Like what it goes on, it doesn't even matter. It could be on anything. I'm right. focused on making the, I want to make the best pesto really? <laughs> ever. Um, we have a trip to Sardinia if you want to get some practice. You yo, know, let me stories. know. But I love, um, I really love like um, Italian cuisine. And so I've gone from like, trying to make pasta and like trying to perfect my own sauces. Um, and once I get the sauce game right, which I'm almost there, I'll go to like making my own pasta from scratch. And then 
It's gonna be game over. Okay, I'm I'm interested it's in seeing game when over, it, baby. When you pers- perfected it. You better invite to your uh, dinner yeah, parties for sure. Um, let's see what what are your goals and dreams, professionally and personally, or whichever one you prefer to share. Um, personally, my goals, my one of my biggest goals right now is to just travel the world with my partner. There's a, we took a big trip this last year. Um, a friend got married in the south of France, and we were like, you know what, let's just stay for a while and. So we were in the south of France, and we were in Paris, and um, did like Avignon, Marseille, yeah, so on and so forth, and and then Avignon, but yeah. And then on our way back, we stopped in London. One of his artists was performing there. Um, She just won five Brit Awards, actually, which is crazy. Ray, check her out; she's really good. Um, And that was a really beautiful experience. I hadn't been to Europe before, um, and I realized once I really the moment I landed I was like damn I should have been doing this a lot sooner but all we but all we've got is time right and so I'm one of my biggest personal goals is to just continue traveling because it was some things changed for me up here like I could feel some things shift and I want to I want to keep pursuing that feeling because it was insane I mean, I'm hooked. It was insane. I travel. I was like, man, I got to get, I got to become more remote so I can (laughs) travel even more. Um, That's like my biggest goal. I think, I think doing that will help me achieve some of my more career based goals. But the biggest thing for me above all is to just travel. Everything else will take care of itself. That's a nice goal. I can, I can relate. Um, What advice would you give high school you? Yo, my high school self, I feel like there is so much I would say to that kid, but I think I would say like, I would encourage my, I think I would try to be fearless. I would say like, push harder, like be less afraid, like be less afraid. Because I think a lot of the things that I ended up pursuing and like expressing, it was all okay. And there was really nothing. I came out when I was like late in high school and like that was something I was very afraid of doing. I wish I would have just done it sooner. Um, how how receptive was your family? My family was like good about it. My yeah. da- it took my parents some time to like understand what my life was gonna be like. Um, but like hindsight is twenty twenty, and when I look back at it now, they were great. Like yeah. honestly, I it could have been a lot more challenging. It was challenging before I came out because I think they they could see that there was something that I wasn't right. telling them, and I think it was a lot of we're confused and we're frustrated because we don't know what to do because you, we don't want to say it for you. And so I think that created a lot of like, Mm. I felt sometimes attacked or I felt misunderstood or I sometimes felt like I was, people had offended me. But I think ultimately a lot of that tension was just coming out of the fact that we couldn't put language to it because I hadn't gotten the level of comfortability to just come out and say those things and some people would say oh well people should have made the space more safe for you i think also i had a responsibility in it myself to create and kind of set the stage so that the conversation could happen and once it did i mean it was complicated but right my mom and dad are great people and so probably the one of the best responses to that question i've heard so Yeah, I got and I realize my privilege in that too. Like, it's not, it doesn't work like that for everybody. But I, you know, yeah, I'm I'm feeling, you know, protected by my ancestors and and most things that I do. And I think in that moment, I felt very protected to just like be myself. I appreciate you sharing that information. That's definitely on the more personal side. So thank you. Yeah, yeah. I I like when people give their authentic personal answers because it makes it more interesting. We're here to get to know you. Sure, you got to get to know the real me. Exactly, we're getting to know you. Um. What's your favorite part of Outsiders? You. Oh, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy is my favorite part of Outsiders. Um, but real, real, true, and that's, that is true. I'm not just saying that. Um, but I think my, one of my favorite things about my interactions with the participants and those of you that lead it is like there's a – I love curious adults, right? Curious adults are the type of people I want to be around. And I feel like whenever we do that, you know, this yearly like experience for the marathon, I see a lot of people who are just like curious about each other and they're always curious to get, to get to know me. They always have a lot of questions about like JD sports and like what I'm doing and like, Oh, you should come to this thing because we're going here. And like, 
what do you like doing? Okay, you should come to this event. And I think adults that just are curious and ask questions, and you can see them operating in a way that is clearly fueled by curiosity. I love that. And it maintains youth. I feel yeah, youth is- Yeah, it keeps you fresh. Exactly. And I'm like, you always gotta be asking questions and then seeking out what those answers are. And I think that outsiders, and maybe I'm getting this wrong, but I think the outsiders is a great space for people that want to do that. Um, and I love that. I, I think my favorite part of Outsiders- That's why you've got a podcast. Is, exactly. Well, like, that's, that's well, to that point, my favorite part of Outsiders is the human story. So mm-hmm. when I'm on a- on one of the adventures with someone I haven't met yet. And they're usually asking me tons of questions about like, you know, how I started Outsiders, what my nine to five is, like <laughs> questions like that. Yeah. Um, uh, and when I tell them like this full time, this is my more nine questions to five. and so on. So, but then I get to start asking them questions mm-hmm. because I want to know about them. I want to know one, how they found us and then two, why they're interested and then get to know them specifically beyond totally. just like market research. Right. So yeah, uh, I love that aspect. I love this podcast because I get to learn what, you know, I, I, I've, we've known each other for a couple of years now, but mm-hmm. we don't really know each other. So I get to know about your history. And it this takes time known for decades who come on the show and I think I know everything about them and they'll divulge some information, really interesting facts about their lives. I had no idea about, and I love those moments for me. The curiosity of the human story is the one the community, the passion, all that stuff. Totally. Um, so yes, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, how do you incorporate exploration in your life? Uh, and how do you continue fostering the love of the outdoors? Um, yeah, I mean, I grew up in the outdoors and I love the smell of fresh air. I love the I love this sort of feeling of accomplishment that comes with moving through a like through the world like whether that's like a bike ride across town or like walking to your friend's house like I enjoy moving my body through the world and so I try my best to to not be too still and if I am still then I want my mind to be active and moving around and and exploring ideas Um, I wish that I spent more time outdoors and so as you know I think and as I'm here talking to you with outsiders, but I think ultimately one of my goals, and I should have said this is a personal goal, like beyond traveling more, um, is just getting my friends outside of the bubble of the city. One of the things about nightlife that is tricky is that I have to be in New York a lot and have to be in the city a lot, have to be downtown a lot. And so um, I think for me this summer, I will be sort of figuring out how to find that balance of like, let's take some time to be out and about and sort of how do we expand this experience of music so that it can be more mobile and like I might be able to use your help with initiative we were able to execute once and only once it was um, doing outings on like a Monday or Tuesday when people from the service industry have off Mm -hmm. and providing them the outlet that we provide the public on weekends yeah Um, we did it once it was great so we took people surfing at Rockaway Beach. Love that. It was awesome. We had like 30 people uh, from nightlife venues, bars, and, and restaurants. The challenge was when we tried to do it again, it's like they're very last minute. And it was like we could do a hike for them. And two days before the hike, we had like three signups. And then we do like we're going to cancel and no one's showing up. The day before, the night before, we had 10 people call us like, hey, is this still happening? Like, I, don't, I can't seem to sign up. I'm like, it doesn't work that like that, you know, but I think with the right people involved, I'd, I'd love to be able to offer that. Cause I think people in that life can use it the most. Oh yeah. We need so, a break. So, uh, if you're up for the challenge, I'm willing to extend. Yeah. Let me know. Let me know. All of branch to the night left. And to the night, to the night girl. He's like, we need a little outdoor time too. <laughs> we do. <laughs> yeah, I, remember, I remember craving a healthier social environment. Yeah. So that's it. Yep. Yeah, totally. I can relate to that. Perfect. So, so, so much. You're, uh, you've been now nominated to do that. <laughs> All right. Let's, um, add it to, let's add it to the list. <laughs> my favorite question. What is your most embarrassing moment? In the oh, world? man. There, yeah. I will tell you this. I have embarrassed myself my fair share of times. I really have. And I'm okay with that. Which one stands out? <laughs> I know you got. Oh, he's got one for sure. Look at this reaction. 100%. He has... 
He's done something really embarrassing. No, Let's see what it is. There, there are just so many. I, but I would honestly, I would think that one of my most embarrassing moments. Gosh, I'm having a hard time. Okay, so I was in a musical when I was in high school, The Wizard of Oz, actually, which is so cliche because I grew up in Kansas, but. <laughs> 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 right, well, I, I was for this, and so we are. Um, I I didn't have a big part in this musical, I, but I had it. What I thought was in him, all no small parts, right? We were. Um, <laughs> I did some like dancing. I was part of this like little like little chorus line and some other things. And there is a section in this iteration of the musical where these like jitterbugs do this dance. And I grew up like doing like martial arts, and I'm a very acrobatic kid, and so. My friends were like, oh, we're going to throw some like tumbling and like some flips into this routine and we need you to do it. And I was like, yeah, easy. I'm like, I was still doing Taekwondo at the time. So I'm a very, I was like, this is easy. This is the easiest thing you guys have asked me to do. So I'm happy to do it. So we'd done rehearsals, like a whole season of rehearsals. And we're doing our like final runs before the performances the next day. And so we're doing it in full costume and we're kind of, we've added all the finishing touches. Nothing is going to change. And we had these gloves on, these white gloves. But I'd never done this routine with these gloves on before. And I didn't think about that. So I'm like, I'm killing it. I'm like eight counts down. I'm like, I've never nailed this performance better. And it, this part comes up to do this like round off back handspring, whatever thing. And I go to, <laughs> and you know where this is going. These gloves. I hit the first one and then the second one comes and my hands just slide and I hit the ground so hard. And it wasn't that it was painful, but like the noise of it all. Just imagine my like 5'10 gangly body like going up and just flopping down on the ground and it's rehearsal. And so luckily there was no one in the audience, but the entire cast and crew who's sitting and there's like probably 60 of us is just like, (laughs) And I like have to get up slowly. I <laughs> nothing nothing has gone wrong up until now. Right. So the music has to stop. Yeah. Everyone has to reset. The props have to reset. My ego is so bruised. And I was just like, oh my God, I'm fine. I you know, you you swear you're okay, you swear you're okay. And what it would have been great if we had moved on, but from then on, everyone kept freaking out. And right before this moment, if it was going to happen again. So everyone's asking me, like, are you good? Are you okay? From that moment until the till we finished doing the performance. So for like 16, 17 shows, my entire cast is, are you going to fall again? Are you going to ruin the oh show again? Is this going to happen again? Should we remove this part? Do we need to worry Talk about, about you? Supportive team. Yeah. I was like, first of all, I'm so embarrassed. And you assholes keep bringing this shit yeah. up. You're <laughs> making it worse. Like every time I'm replaying it in my yeah. head. Um. Again, a lot of things have happened, but that was that, that was terrible. That's because uh, I was so confident. Yeah, I was so confident. Plus, you feel like you're owning it, right? And, and I was like, "Yeah, I'm killing reality it. check. I'm killing it." And man, that was yeah. not that was not my best moment. Mm. Well, thank you for sharing that. Was that my last time doing a musical? I think it was. I did not. I didn't what step. A, I didn't, I didn't it go off. back to the stage after that. I was like, "Oh, no. that was ru- that I ruined said, you, really. No more. That's hilarious. <laughs> Um, all right, so we reached a part in our interview where we ask you five rapid fire questions. Okay, period. <clears throat> so you know how that works? Are you ready? I am so ready. Let me take a drink of water. Go for it. I'll do the same. <clears throat> we'll get ready to go. Mm. All right, so are you ready? Yes. What is your favorite city other than New York City? Mm, favorite city other than New York City? Chicago. Oh, why Chicago. Um, it was my first idea of like big city outside of my own city. Um, and I spent, I used to go to Lollapalooza with my friends in college every summer. So I have this, mem- like my memories of Chicago or Lollapalooza and my best friends, we would just like road trip or take the train up and go. And like, so I love the city for that reason. How far is it from Kansas City? Um, it's a pretty long drive. I, I'm going to get this wrong because I haven't made that drive in forever, but it's got to be at least eight hours in a car. Maybe oh, wow. more than that. Um, we would take the we would drive to Kansas City though, or like drive over and then take the train up. Um, and I love the train. Yeah, I love a train ride. I feel like I'm on Harry Potter. It's so <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> Great reference. Um, if you could do any other profession, what would you do? And you have like two professions now, so a third. Mm, if I could do any 
Um, I wanted to be a teacher when I was in school because I had great educators growing up. Um, so I always thought that if I could sort of channel the experience of my favorite teachers back to other students, that that would be it. So yeah, but maybe college professor, honestly, because like kids are insane. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, agree I would do that yeah. or I would love to do something like so I can be close to the water, whether that's like, I don't know, just something in aquatics boat like a i don't know a professional sailor or you know, some I, shit like that when i was a kid like boating boating as a profession would be sick like being in the water is so relaxing i would and just be chilling i'd be so tan i'd be looking good all year long yeah it depends on where you're at great access to seafood yeah yeah and a beachfront property that's my goal i would love that not that i'd be able to afford it but in my fantasy i would then then well, shoot, you're going you're gonna to aim for that in your real life, oh, I think yeah. it's possible. Yes. Uh, what is your vice? My vice? Man, I love soda. Really? Shame on you. I know. <laughs> I got to shame you for that. Really? I do. It's I feel so, like, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. And I don't drink a lot of it, but when I do, I feel my body vibrating. Cause that's how I know I love it. Caffeine and sugar, yeah, of course. I, maybe, yeah, it's a physiological it's response. Out of your system. It's a physiological response. What kind of, go ahead. What, what, this is funny because out of all the interviews you ever did that he asked somebody with their vices, this is the first time he said, what's wrong with you? <laughs> yeah, doctor, we, we got are some you, vices that are What have you heard? <laughs> Dr. Pepper's where you draw the line? Yeah, well, so is Dr. Pepper's your vice? Hell yeah, man. Dr. Dr. Pepper. Man. And not Mr. Pibb. What were some really Dr. bad Pepper. ones? Uh, people like said weed. People said <laughs> some other things. <laughs> Listen, I like had that. I had a college experience of like being a pothead and like, uh, college ended and it was like that desire to do that just left I, my I body. Say, obviously, it, depending on how much you do anything, but soda is bad. Soda and bag of chips, they say, is like leading cause of death or like diabetes and all kinds of stuff. I love Dr. Pepper. What would you have preferred I said? I don't know. I, that's a great one, though. That's a great vice because I can understand I'm it. I have real. a sweet tooth. I'm being for real. Soda's not so much my thing, although, like, on occasion, I'll crave, like, you know, those. Coca Cola's in a glass bottle, like that's the best. I think that's where it started. Yeah. Restaurants and like the Mexican Coke in a bottle. You're yeah, like, wow, yeah. this is like a luxury. I mean, I think for New York, maybe the uh, equivalent would be like a fountain soda and a slice of pizza in the summer. Like, yeah, that is just like for me, yeah. it's nostalgia. Dr like, Pepper, yeah. that or like, yeah, no, that's orange. It. I used to love orange soda as a kid. I love orange juice. My boyfriend will tell you if you bring a bottle of like a jug of orange juice into my well, home, you, though, I will drink it. What kind of OJ? So fast. Like, like like freshly pressed or like? Uh, I prefer Trump fresh, freshly pressed because I want some pulp in there. Yeah, like I love pulp and an orange juice. However, if you bring me just any old like, not Sunny Delight, obviously, but if you bring me any old jug of orange, orange juice, juice. <laughs> I don't care what version it is. I'm gonna crush it in less. I than used to two be that hours. way, but it's now so I've gotten bad. spoiled. And I want fresh OJ only. Yeah, my the but. cafe near me does like fresh pressed OJ, and it's like. Yeah, mm. I was thinking about. I looked up. I, I love yeah. it so much. I looked up uh, the machines that you put the oranges on top. Seven hundred dollars. I like. I considered it. Does anybody have? Are we gonna start a GoFundMe for your yeah, orange exactly. juice maker. <laughs> exactly. Well, I also had a business idea for it too, but I'll keep that separate. Yeah, keep that to yourself. Keep um, that to yourself. What's your greatest fear? Oh God! First of all, where do I start? <laughs> <laughs> um, my greatest fear. My greatest fear. My greatest fear, honestly, is to not is to, is leaving, is to not leave my comfort zone. I'm afraid that there's something out there for me that if I don't stretch myself, I won't find it. And so I'm afraid of not finding that. So I'm trying to push myself as much as I can. Well, let me ease your fear a little bit. Because you have this fear, you'll never not push yourself out of the comfort yeah, zone. I'm just like, what if that thing that, I, that is, I've been searching yeah. for is right on the other side of... You have major FOMO. I'm afraid of You that. are like a FOMO. So I'm just like, no, I'm like, yeah. I gotta go. I gotta go. You 100% have FOMO. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. I can admit that. I'm the... If there was a, a club for the FOMO havers, I would probably be in charge of them. Me too. However, but my FOMO like has crippling. changed. Yeah. It used to be like, what's happening in the city? What's going on? What what events were... Now it's more like, um, more travel oriented. Yeah, it's like, what's happening out there in the world? Yeah, exactly. And like... Will I get to experience that or will I get like, to meet? I know like, I travel like a maniac. I understand. But when I see, when I'm home back from a trip and I see somebody exploring like an exotic place, like I love Japan or whatever, 
I'm like, damn. Yeah, I'm like, if I die and I never made it to Tokyo, I'm gonna be pissed. I made it four times. You, you should. I'm be gonna be like, damn. I should have just. I should have just booked the trip. You should. That is to me is like die, well, dying with those regrets. I'm, I'm afraid you, of. Let me give you a tip. So I remember, uh, I hadn't traveled like before. I really started my my path on traveling a lot. I realized I had been working nonstop, like promoting and establishing myself in the industry. And I realized I hadn't traveled in a long time. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I think I heard an ex-girlfriend had moved overseas. And I was like, damn, what, what am I doing? Like, I want to be able to live life. If she's doing it. Why can't I? I feel like I'm more worldly or I should be. So I, uh, I call up a friend of mine who I know could travel, was into traveling. I'm like, yo, meet me in my house. Let's, uh, let's figure out a plan to go somewhere. So we go on like Travelocity, one of these websites. And where should we go? And a pop-up comes up for Tokyo for 800 bucks on American Airlines. So I click and I bought it, bought it. And he looks at me like, you didn't just do that. I'm like, I did just do that. You're coming with me. Let's go. And it was an amazing trip. I say that to say it's... What as, year was this? 2007. If I ever see a flight to Tokyo for $800, there are that. There I'm are. Booking. There are. Depends on, there I are. need to turn on my alerts. Turn them on. Google, there's I need there's to get my on seasons, popping. there's some very cheap flights out there. And I'm definitely not opposed to traveling in odd mm. seasons. Like, Me neither. I'll go wherever. If it's, matter of fact, I'd rather go when it's not like people like, you've been to Rio, I've been to Rio twice, but like, have you been to Carnival? I'd love to go to Carnival, sure, but I'd rather yeah. experience a place when it's normal. Yeah, not like, peak travel. It's exactly. Crazy. I sure I'd love to go for certain events too, but I want to know what it's like because my travel I'd like to see if I could live in the place. What is life like? Yeah, it's always That's, you're sort exactly. of exploring, anthropological in that way. Exactly, and I want to know. I always, I always, this is my saying. I, always, I want to know when I ask you where to go eat. Tell me where the locals go eat on a Tuesday night when they don't want to cook. I want to go eat there. That's period. That's, that's yeah, my thing. That's the that's the way. That's the way. Uh, so okay, what's your favorite food? And did you bring it with you today? Okay, so <clears throat> I have a favorite food. Yeah. We did a lot of five. We did a lot of rapid what's your fire. Greatest fear? Yeah. I think we. He did yeah. announce it. He did, I did prepare. I did, I did. So my favorite food. Okay, so here's the thing. My favorite food is this little meal. Wait, hold on. Why are we talking about it? You didn't bring anything. No, today? I didn't know. I ate it, but I brought something else. <laughs> but I brought something else. But I brought. Something okay, else. wait, 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 wait. Go. I don't want to interrupt your story. Tell, tell us what you. So mean. I, my favorite <laughs> little restaurant is this place, Chibao. This is a Cuban spot in Lower East Side. You can get a quarter chicken with rice and beans for like five dollars, and that is my favorite thing to eat. What Any, was it called? It's Chibao. Where is that? It's Lower East Side, Rivington and Clinton Street. Oh, amazing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I love going there, but I went there, and before I could make it over here, the food was eaten. <laughs> so. <laughs> it's not that far. <laughs> it is kind of far, okay? I had to walk, but. What did you bring instead? I had this. I've had this with me all day as a backup because I had a feeling this would happen. <laughs> Um, well, really quick, you ordered uh, roast chicken, rice, quarter chicken. What color rice? White rice. Oh, yellow rice. Yellow rice. Yeah. What color beans? The little pigeon peas. Oh, uh, more like rice and beans yeah. together. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So good. Plantains. Cheap. I sometimes plantains, not all the time. I'll get uh, full. I'll get. I'll get full too fast if I do plantains. Okay. So I might. I eat those later. Yeah. But so what's I hear creek. Okay. Creek, creek so. Thing. Okay. These little things are my favorite. Now, in you cannot buy the version that my dad likes here. It's like this random brand, and they make them in three different flavors, and there's vanilla, chocolate, and strawberry. I see, yeah. And I've searched high and low for that brand in New York. Are they also Italian brand? You're no, about? it's some random-ass brand. Hmm. But these are the next best thing, and I'm obsessed with them. I've had this little cookie wafer treat as a snack after, like before bed. The problem is the bag disappears. So often, yeah. me and my siblings would fight over these things. Yeah. But like, if I'm having a bad day, yeah, this is what I will eat. And that, a doctor, and a doctor pepper, and a doctor pepper, and a doctor pepper with that. Not at the same time. Oh, I was gonna say that's. I mean, what would you, what would you pair with that? Usually, it depends. Like, some I don't really love to have stuff like this in the morning, but it's really good with coffee. Honestly. It's great with like a little. Like it's great with like a order. coffee or a latte, yeah. or if you're feeling real crazy, this with some ice cream is like the best yeah. thing ever. Drop it in like vanilla ice cream or something. Oh yeah, yeah. Or like tiramisu. Okay. Party time. Yeah. Oh, so you're yeah. Crazy now. Yeah. <laughs> this the thing about this little wafer. She's versatile. They're yeah. just versatile, yeah. and I'm obsessed with them. That's a good choice. You want one? Uh, I can't eat that unfortunately. I'm gonna eat one. You enjoy yourself. Do you want one of those? This this oh, you will. You, he never says yes to any food, and he's saying yes to this. I'm surprised. This is my treat. The same ones? Not these ones, but like wafers. 
Have you ever had them before? Oh, okay. Yeah, oh, my God. I can see that a little, little coffee would be good for you. Yeah. I would drink it with tea, yeah. Yeah. Oh, nice. baby. <laughs> see, I'm going to eat this whole thing. You will. That's the problem with things like this. I, I can't ration it. I have to eat the whole bag. Um, yeah, there is. Give me that. Let me see. Let's see. Sugar police over here. I, I, mean, I know yeah. I was gonna come here and get grilled for my consumption I mean, I, habits. Yeah, we'll through, we'll okay. Yeah, it's like everything I can't eat in this, which is so good. Uh, well, listen, I appreciate you sharing that and sharing your life story or, or certain parts of your life with us. Yeah, of course. I promise I will come to a DJ set. You come to an outsiders, and, outsiders event. and then we'll also organize something. And we'll for organize for something the on service industry. I think it's Monday, very important Tuesday. for us to do that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's great to get, get to know you. And, Good to get uh, to know you as well. Yeah, I w- we gotta hang out. Outside of that, we're the outsiders. North Face, shout out to you. Yeah, thank you. Shout for the out gear, to North Face. Yes, oh, look at that gear. This Isn't is that amazing. Shout exactly. out to Haley for knowing, without even knowing you. Yeah, whoever picked this out for me. Haley, Haley Albright. Haley, you're the real MVP. There you you're go. The, you're the real, <laughs> you're the real MVP of this episode. So thank you very much for keeping me dripped out. My boyfriend's gonna be so jealous. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, stay tuned for next episode. Thanks for watching. All right. Look at the way the sunshine is. Is it? Yeah, this, what do you